from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with breaking news. A bad accident in West Bear County. And you can see cars and emergency vehicles strewn all throughout this two-lane highway. This is at Wiseman and Cottonwood Way. That is past 1604 west of Loop 1604. This happened about 445. We're told there's five vehicles involved here. You can see what looks like four of them kind of clustered up there together, but then one vehicle further on down the road. No fatalities reported here, but there are injuries, and we don't know exactly what led up to this scene. These five vehicles involved in this wreck, but people certainly injured here in far west Bear County. Yeah, you can actually make out the red vehicle that's towards the top of the screen now to the right side of the screen that was part of this accident. What you don't see here is the massive traffic backup again. Wiseman and Cottonwood Road are they are backed up in both directions right now. Cottonwood Way, excuse me, backed up in both directions and backed up for miles the last time we saw it. But now I think they've shut down the highway so far up that people are actually getting off. Nope, there's still some people that are stuck on this roadway. But again, a massive accident. We don't know the extent of the injuries, but we do know there were some. We'll continue to follow this. Anger and frustration, those feelings for many after the release of a man accused of killing his wife in 2019. Andre McDonald posted bail on Friday. He's charged with murder and tampering with evidence in connection to the death of his wife, Andreen McDonald. As our Jaffney Gray reports, a local nonprofit has stepped into care for Andreen's child and mother who say they are even more afraid now to leave their home. She's a girl. Bittersweet. And Andreen was such a, oh gosh, beautiful diva. And so I wanted just to get some things that maybe Andreen would have picked out for her. That's how Eagles Flight San Antonio CEO Pamela Allen described her shopping trip this morning. She bought clothes and toys. She loves playing with baby girls. For Andrea McDonald's 10-year-old daughter, who we are not identifying for the little girl's protection. She's rambunctious. She's funny. Uh, I like uh, interacting with her. But on the other side of that goofiness, Alan says the girl is traumatized. Her mother, Andreen, was killed, dismembered, and burned in 2019. Her remains were found months later. The little girl's father, Andre McDonald, was arrested in connection with his wife's death. She witnessed some events. However, because she has autism, her statements are not valid. Allen and her organization have been helping the 10 year old and her grandmother, Hyacinth Smith, have been displaced, gone through trauma, have struggled for even food, which is why she says she's even more angry after McDonald posted bail Friday. His bond was lowered to $250,000 at his last hearing. He gets freedom and yet they're so scared they've secluded themselves. The girl's father is now on partial house arrest and is allowed to work. Allen says she hopes McDonald finds it in his heart to start providing for his daughter. He's still facing charges of murder and tampering with evidence in connection with the death of his wife. His next hearing is scheduled for early next month with his trial expected to happen sometime in January. At the Kadena Reeves Justice Center, Jackie Gray, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police investigating what they're calling a road rage shooting after a woman was shot by a driver who may have been cut off. This happened during the morning rush hour near I-35 and Theo Avenue. Police found the victim at Mission Trails Baptist Hospital where her husband took her to get help. As Katrina Weber reports, this was also a close call for the woman's daughter. Based on what police tell us, the victim of that road rage shooting was able to shield her child from harm. However, she ended up taking a bullet to the back. Her husband brought her here to Mission Trails Baptist Hospital for treatment, but police say she needed a trauma center. While that decision was being made inside the emergency room, investigators were outside processing the car that had been carrying the family. Police say the woman was riding in the passenger seat, but dove into the back seat where her seven-year-old daughter was when bullets began to fly. The trouble for them started after 7.30 this morning, south of downtown near Interstate 35 and Theo Avenue. Police say another driver, apparently angry about being cut off, pulled out a gun and took aim. Officers later searched the highway and found several shell casings. The shooter got away. After the family showed up at this hospital, an ambulance took the 29-year-old woman to University Hospital. 
Police described her wound as life-threatening. Police were not able to offer us much information right away on the shooter or his car. The last we heard, they were still looking for surveillance video that might provide clues. Reporting from the South Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. From a close call to a young child to one caught in the crossfire, San Antonio police searching for whoever fired a shot that hit a three year old boy late last night at an apartment complex. It happened after 10 last night along Ben's Engelman near I 35 on the northeast side. Now, according to officers, a woman and her two children were leaving after visiting family members at that apartment complex when two SUVs pulled in behind them and started shooting at each other. Then she saw the little boy had been shot in the leg. He's expected to be OK. No other injuries were reported so far. No arrests. Big reward now being offered for information that leads to an arrest in a three year old murder investigation. 25 year old Oscar Thompson was shot on November 9th, 2018 on Stonegate Drive. Police say that he was driving a friend home when someone fired several shots at his car. Thompson was hit once, then lost control and crashed into a utility pole. He died a week later in the hospital. Investigators say they're looking for whoever was behind the wheel of a maroon Ford expedition. Anyone with any information that can help police in this case, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. One ran for president, one may be thinking about it. Buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. The political showdown is on between Greg Abbott and Beto O'Rourke. A Democrat and former congressman, presidential contender and U.S. Senate nominee today announced he wants to unseat the twice elected Republican governor. Each says the other side has problems communicating with voters. Those in positions of public trust have stopped listening to, serving and paying attention to and trusting the people of Texas. And so they're not focused on the things that we really want them to do. They misread the hearts, the souls, the minds, the vision, the desire, and the future sought by the Hispanic community. Have to be there. O'Rourke kicked off his campaign with an eight-day tour across Texas. Tomorrow he's expected to be in San Antonio before heading down to Laredo in the Rio Grande Valley. Governor Greg Abbott told supporters in Floresville today, with their help and others, Texas will remain a Republican-led state. Hi, I'm Representative Ina Minjares, and I'm announcing my candidacy for Bear County Judge. In other campaign news, Democratic State Rep for District 124, Ina Minjares, is making it official. She wants to be the next Bear County judge, taking over for Judge Nelson Wolf, who is not seeking re-election next year. Minjares joins Judge Peter Sakai as the only official candidates in this race so far, but there are a few potential candidates considering the idea of running. They'll have to until December 13th to get that paperwork filed. The primary for the 2022 election is in March and the general election is next November. In Bear County, 88 infants have died from sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS in the past five years. There is no known cause, but over the decades, experts have identified risk factors. On the heels of an event honoring lives lost, Metro Health is making sure the public knows about programming to help prevent these deaths. Courtney Friedman spoke to a family that is taking full advantage. <laughs> Evelyn Rose Chapa's two boys, Joshua and Christopher, are the light of her life, but her journey to parenthood began in a dark place. I did have a son that passed. Um, I was 21 weeks pregnant and I was in a bad car accident. <laughs> Then a year and a half ago, she and her husband Joshua Harville welcomed Joshua II into the world. He was born premature, one of the risk factors associated with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, when a child dies unexpectedly before their first birthday. So even when, like I said, even when he was first born, I was just like watching his tummy go up and down. It was really nerve wracking. <laughs> So they enrolled in Bear County Metro Health's Healthy Start program, filled with all kinds of classes and programs built to encourage wellness and prevent things like SIDS. We teach moms to look for signs of preterm labor and what to do. Um, one of the best things that a mom can do is to get good prenatal care. Healthy Start Senior Management Coordinator Amanda Ponton says another main risk factor is unsafe sleeping practices like co-sleeping and others. You need to lay your baby on their back on a flat surface like a 
a crib or a pack and play, make sure the sheets are pulled tight, they can't be loose, and most importantly, make sure that there is nothing in the crib, including blankets or stuffed animals. Whether you're a new parent or an experienced parent, the stuff they teach you can still help you out. I found out, you know, through this program that, hey, you know, I, I feel more confident in, in how I'm doing things. I'm I, I got this. The small worries may never go away. Oh, never mind. He's, He's sleeping. Dead. But the fear of the unknown can. <laughs> Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Healthy Start is free and helps during pregnancy and after, offering at-home check-ins, help with stress management, breastfeeding, even domestic violence. To sign up, head to Metro Health's Healthy Start website. It's turn to weather right now. Live cam outside, 74 degrees. Ooh, look at nice that picture. Nice sunset. Yeah. A little warmer today than I was expecting. It, it is warmer outside. Uh, and in fact, even tonight, temperatures are in the 70s rather than in the 50s, like they typically are this time of year once the sun starts to set. We got up to 80 degrees. That is 8 degrees above the average high temperature of 72. Quick check of the aquifer. It is down two tenths of a foot over the past 20 24 hours, but still at a healthy level. And some good news here. Yesterday, mold was high. Now it's low. Juniper, ragweed, and grass are present in low amounts as well. If you're planning to be out and about this evening, know that temperatures won't cool off as quickly. We'll still be looking at temperatures in the mid-60s by midnight, and clouds will increase. We'll have some more fog tomorrow morning, another warm day, and then a cold front is on the way. I'll have a look at that forecast after the break. Welcome back. So here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Deputies in Bear County are noticing something pretty disturbing that scammers targeting vulnerable people, especially those with missing loved ones. Tonight on the night beat, how an innocent social media post can lead to a call that no one ever wants to receive. Also, something else that's disturbing. We've seen at least four hit and runs in less than a week. And tonight, we're going to take a look at the increase in deadly crashes. And also, you're going to hear messages from families, affected families, that is, and police. We're going to have those stories and a lot more for you tonight on the Night Beat. We'll see you then. Maida? All right, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, streets in bad shape could be a real headache for drivers and for the cities that are trying to keep track of them. So the city of Seguin was happy to welcome some new technology that makes that a little bit easier. Yeah, our Samuel King joined us now. Samuel, I'm guessing this process is way more efficient. Yeah, definitely, Stephen Meyer. Before last week, Seguin was tracking the conditions of its streets basically by hand, a process that could take weeks or even months. This new technology on this vehicle allows them to do that in just a matter of days. If you were in Teguin over the past week, you might have seen this vehicle from the company ESP crisscrossing the city, gathering information. We're looking at pictures being taken every 15 feet. Those pictures plus lasers create a one-two punch, determining what's known as a street's pavement condition index, or PCI. You can see the middle part of the road, sidewalk, and that's just letting you know the actual lasers going through, penetrating through the asphalt, looking for any cracks, looking for any imperfections in the asphalt. The city hopes to use that data collected to better determine what sorts of needs there are on city streets and better allocate taxpayer money. And it can tell us how many roads we can do per year in order to show us what those roads should be. John Donnelly is Seguin's public works director. We don't want to do all the worst streets first. We want to work in the middle so that we can keep the streets that are in the middle at a higher PCI so we don't have everything at the failed uh, category. Seguin isn't the only place where this high-tech data collection is happening. Roadway Asset Services has surveyed other cities, including San Antonio and Austin. Instead of being a reactive mode, and you know, wait till the road starts falling apart or you've got a lot of complaints to go out and fix it. Uh, the city can now get into a preventive mode to where they're out ahead of the distress and the problems. Now that the data has been collected, the city says it will take a few weeks for it to be analyzed and entered into that new database. As for uh, this evening's commute, watching this downtown, this is the Transguide view at I-37 at Jones. You can see uh, sort of a crash there and you can see uh, some delays in that area. So watch out for that if you're on 37 downtown. Also have some delays on I-10 approaching I-37. 16 minutes now from Loop 410, only five minutes outbound. That gives you an indication 
of the delay. We've been watching, as you saw at the top of the newscast, this situation out at Wiseman Boulevard and Cottonwood Way. Uh, the Wiseman is actually closed here at 1604. <laughs> seeing some delays there on the west side on 1604 and on 151. So that just gives us an indication here. 15 minutes now just to get from 410 to 1604, five minutes the other direction. So some big delays in far west Bear County this evening. Steve Meyer. I apologize for my cough, Samuel, but I was envisioning that they used to do the road thing in Seguin by hand. Yes. I'm envisioning a <laughs> pavement whisperer, like with his ear against <laughs> his the ear to the ground. Yeah. Little, Tapping little it more, with a stick or something. Little little probably more sophisticated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so this view, envision an ice rink in just a couple of days. Sky 12 over Travis Park here. It's 74 degrees, but let's talk about ice skating because there's an ice rink coming to San Antonio. Yeah. yeah, envision an ice rink and a Christmas tree there That's too. Nice. They're gonna be working on that there very shortly. Yeah, and maybe a little ice to cool you down today after the, the heat we experienced in the afternoon. Uh, you know, temperatures climbed up to 80 degrees today and we're starting to get into that time period of where's the rain? We could use a little bit of rain. Now we don't have any drought yet in San Antonio, but here's rainfall by the numbers for the month so far. We've seen a little bit less than half an inch of rain so far this month, and that is almost three quarters uh, of an inch of rainfall in deficit. We could use a little rain, but so far for the year we've been doing just fine. More than 32 inches of rain, which is more than three inches above the average for this time this year. But keep in mind that we really don't have significant rain chances in the the forecast. In fact, our only chance for rain through Saturday is going to be Wednesday night into Thursday morning as we get our next cold front. And even then, the chance for rain is not great. About a 20% chance for isolated showers and storms Wednesday night as that front moves through. So yeah, we could use a little rain, but we are going to have to wait until uh, past Saturday to really see a significant rainfall in San Antonio. There are some indications that on Thanksgiving we could have some rain in the area, but that's way too far off in the distance to nail down details. But of course, we'll keep you updated. Yeah, the high temperature today was 80 degrees. That's eight degrees above the average of 72. You can notice that up in the hill country, temperatures were a little cooler, 76 for the high in Kerrville. We did have a deck of clouds west of 35 that hung around through about uh, lunchtime for those in the hill country. That's why temperatures were a little bit cooler. It got up to 86 in Del Rio and near 90 degrees in Catula. Looking at the high-res future cast a lot like this morning, tomorrow morning, we are going to have areas of fog, especially west of I-35. We'll get down to 60 degrees, which is quite a bit above the average temperature. So not necessarily sweater weather tomorrow by any means. And in fact, we'll see those, that deck of clouds and fog clear in the morning hours. And once again in the afternoon, it's going to be sunny and warm. 82 degrees for the high temperature in San Antonio even warmer, closer to 90 out toward Del Rio. On the radar and satellite picture, very quiet across the central plains. We've actually got a ridge of high pressure overhead that's sending all the rain up and over the central plains and including Texas. But many areas across the northeast dealing with their first snow of the season. A ridge of high pressure at the upper levels of the atmosphere is keeping out the rain, but a surface level high is continuing to bring in that Gulf of Mexico moisture. That's why you might have noticed that it feels just a touch muggy outside in the afternoons. It's because we're seeing that Gulf moisture move in and tomorrow winds will be breezy from the south, gusting up to 25. You can see that we're part of the warmest part of the country here right now across the state of Texas. Much colder air where that snow is occurring and then our cold front is currently sitting over the Pacific right now. And again, this one is going to be moving through Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Let me show you the future cast of that event and you can see what I mean. Rain is going to be isolated Wednesday night into Thursday morning as that front moves through. And even this forecast model might be overdoing it a little bit, but we'll continue to keep you updated. Behind that front, it's going to get breezy and cool. High temperatures will only be in the 60s on Thursday and Friday. So it's not a potentially potent 
potent cold front, but it's strong enough to be noticed, especially from Wednesday to Thursday. You'll notice that 20 degree difference. And then there's another front in the forecast by late Sunday, early Monday of next week. Here's a look at tomorrow's forecast for us. Uh, starting off with that fog at 60 degrees. Skies will be clearing 82 for the high temperature. Breezy with winds from the south gusting up to 25 miles per hour. Similar day on Wednesday before that front arrives and that'll knock us back down into the, that fall feeling by Thursday and Friday. More mild over the weekend. Steve, okay. Myra. All right. Thank you, Sarah. You know, Myra, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again this what week. It, what is that? You can't spell undefeated <laughs> without UTSA. Yeah. In fact, if you take a look at it, there are only three undefeated teams now left in the FBS, and UTSA is one of them, but they had their biggest, toughest test coming up this Saturday. When we come back, we'll let you get you ready for UTSA's last home game of the regular season, and there is plenty of turmoil at Texas coming up. Coverage USA West Division title will be on the line this Saturday in the Alamo Dome when the UTSA Roadrunners host the University of Alabama at Birmingham in their final home game of the 2021 regular season. This after the Roadrunners received a little wake-up call from Southern Miss in a game they were favored by 33 points but needed a four-quarter surge to pull out the 27-17 victory. Going into halftime, these two teams are tied at 10 off. After the Golden Eagles had only won one game this season, but their defense was just as advertised. Now tied at 17 all. Six minutes remaining, the Roadrunners defense stepped up. First, Jalen Haynes recovered a fumble by Southern Miss's quarterback that led to a field goal. And then Corey Mayfield gets to the quarterback, forcing this fumble that's recovered by Charles Wiley. That led to the game ceiling touchdown by Sincere McCormick in the 27-17 victory. The Roadrunners are now 10-0, one of three FBS teams that are undefeated, remain at number 15 in the country. It's a blessing. I said this last week, I've never been 9-0. I've never been 10-0, so it's a real blessing, man. Um... This team is something special, like past the football plan, like just the chemistry, the, the the friendships we all got, just it's way bigger than football. So to be 10-0 with this group is big, and it means a lot to us. Wow. Kickoff Saturday is set for 2.30. Let's see how many we can pack into the Alamo Dome for Senior Day. It has been 65 years since the Texas Longhorns lost five games in a row. That's right, 1956, after Kansas is able to score their first conference road win in 13 years of the 57 to 56 victory in overtime in Austin on Saturday night. And they won the game with a two point conversion in overtime, stunning the upset of Texas, who is a team in turmoil right now. During instant replay last night, our viewers voted that the poor performance and terrible season was a fault of the players, not the coaching staff. But setting aside the blame, the Longhorns now stand at four and six and two and five in the Big 12. Just got more bad news. Star running back B.J. Robinson is out for the rest of the season with a dislocated elbow just when you thought it couldn't get any worse. Everybody's upset. We're upset. Everybody feels the uh, the frustration uh, in what has occurred. But I can assure you, nobody's more upset, nobody's more frustrated than we are um, in the performance uh, because we put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work. Uh, not to play the, the, the football that is the standard here at the University of Texas. I misspoke here a little bit. B. John Robinson, of course, kicked off Saturday in West Virginia, set for 11 a.m. The fight Texas Aggies shot at winning the SEC West Division has just gone up in smoke after they lost to Ole Miss on the road Saturday night. The Rebels facing one of the best college defenses in the country came up with a defensive stand of their own. That's after Devin A. Chain was able to cut the Ole Miss lead down to five in the third quarter on the 24-yard touchdown, but two interceptions in the fourth quarter sealed the Aggies' fate, the last of which was A.J. Finley. He returned 52 yards for a touchdown in the 29-19 defeat, dropping the Aggies to 7-3 and three on the season, 4-3 and three in the SEC in what could be his his last home game as an Aggie if he turns pro. How is San Antonio's own DeMarvin Leal approaching this game in College Station Saturday? Definitely feel like it's going to be very emotional. You know, first time in Kyle Field was crazy. So just imagine the last. It's just it's more, it's supposed to be more memorable, you know. So uh, just ready for that game and just ready to have fun with it. All right, the Aggies have two games left in the regular season at home against Prairie View this Saturday, 11 a.m., and on the road against LSU Saturday, November the 27th at 6 p.m. Very disappointing weekend for college football fans. Thank goodness for UTSA. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. We'll be right back. Former senior Trump advisor Steve Bannon surrendered to federal authorities in Washington, D.C. this morning. Bannon was indicted by a federal grand jury for refusing to comply with the subpoena from the Congressional Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol riot. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze in Washington with what happens next. 
A defiant Steve Bannon turning himself in to the FBI and appearing before a federal court as he faces criminal contempt charges. Bannon was released with conditions and is scheduled to be arraigned Thursday. The one-time advisor to former President Trump was indicted last week for defying a subpoena from the Congressional Committee investigating the deadly January 6th Capitol attack. Bannon now vowing to fight the charges. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the misdemeanor from hell for Merrick Garland, Nancy Pelosi, and Joe Biden. We're going to do, we're going to go on the offense. We're tired of playing defense. We're going to go on the offense on this and stand by. He's charged with two counts of contempt for refusing to testify and give documents to lawmakers. The House committee says Bannon is critical to their investigation, pointing to his own words on his podcast January 5th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. And all I can say is strap in. Bannon says he's refusing to cooperate at the request of Trump, who's defending his longtime ally, saying this country has perhaps never done to anyone what they've done to Steve Bannon, and they're looking to do it to others also. Trump insists he and former aides are protected by executive privilege. But that argument might not hold up in court for Bannon. His indictment states he's a private citizen who hasn't worked in the White House since 2017. If convicted, Bannon could face fines and up to two years in prison. Other former Trump officials, including Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, are also refusing to comply with the committee's subpoenas. Lawmakers say they will not hesitate to hold Meadows in contempt. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. News around America now. Sandy Hook families getting a big win against InfoWars founder Alex Jones today in their defamation case against him. Connecticut Superior Court Judge Barbara Bellis cited Alex Jones, quote, willful noncompliance, end quote, with the discovery process as her reason for Monday's decision. Since Jones had not turned over financial data requested by Sandy Hook family plaintiffs, she determined that he loses his case by default. Jones had previously claimed the Sandy Hook school shooting was staged. He since acknowledged the shooting was real. A status conference is scheduled for Wednesday as the case is set to proceed to a hearing on damages. We are trying to understand what is going on with supply chain issues. We know it's a problem. We know things are delayed because of it. But how is it working? What is the origin of the problem? Well, to help us understand all of this, we are pleased to be joined by John Esparza. He's the president and CEO of the Texas Trucking Association. Mr. Esparza, appreciate you joining us on KSAT Q&A. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. How, where did this whole thing start and when will it get easier? Because I know you and your members are at the heart of this whole thing. Well, there's a number of stakeholders involved. Certainly trucking plays a key component of that, but uh, the, the shortage and these delays um, have everything to do with the number of stakeholders that are involved in this. And it's something that, you know, frankly, we could see building over time uh, with the relationships between how all these entities really broker together. You know, we've seen the the pictures of the giant shipping containers sitting out off the coast, stuck on ships. They can't be unloaded. But what is the picture here in Texas? Give us a more or more regional perspective of how that supply chain issue is affecting our state. Well, certainly. Well, it's not as bad as it is in California, not near as bad. As a matter of fact, if you just judge those by the number of ships, for instance, that you see out there, um, I believe they were at 79 uh, uh, before the end of the weekend. I think they're at 80 ships sitting outside of the California ports. It's one of the reasons that you hear um, Governor Abbott and other leaders in the state of Texas uh, inviting uh, partners and partnerships with Texas because the, uh, the the delays are not as significant as they are in California. A four to five delay a day delay for these ships in Texas is currently what you're seeing. Uh, you can actually see those on some of the port websites where they're very transparent about what's happening out there. What are your, what are you, what's the effect for truckers? What is the effect for your members uh, with this whole supply chain? Are, are they working more hours? Are you see, trying to get as many trucks on the road as you can? I mean, what, what's happening? Well, it's the quality of the hours. The trucks aren't allowed to work more hours. They have specific hours of service that they have to adhere to both federal or state um, during the daytime and, or excuse me, during every day. Uh, it's, the, it's other stakeholders that you see at these port operations. 
What are they doing to, to manage these containers? Uh, the quality of the driver's life, unfortunately, isn't so so great a quality when they're having to wait and wait and wait and wait. Uh, a trucker is going to make money when he's moving containers. And if they're sitting for hours and hours and hours on end, uh, not moving containers, oftentimes giving turning away from the port once reaching uh, these port areas because they don't have the right chassis or they can't reach the right box. Um, it's very frustrating. And you see drivers leaving uh, the industry, at least in the intermodal side, to other sectors of trucking. You know, I've been curious throughout this whole thing, is there a certain type of product that you're seeing the biggest delays with or a product that uses a certain material, certain component that really is being affected more than maybe some others? Well, it probably leads us also to what to do about this holiday season by local. Um, I would uh, uh, give a lot of tamales away. I think that's anything that you can get local is going to be something that you're going to want to do to avoid the crunch because it is going to be anything that's imported from overseas, um, you're going to see delays on. And I've had many friends show me websites where they've gone on and, and clicked on items that they're trying to order and something that they pay $20 or $30 for now says $150, $165 for and unknown delays in terms of delivery. I like the advice on tamales because, mm -hmm. well, I like tamales, but <laughs> but also, also, what is the solution here? I mean, I, I, is there something simple that can be done that will help this process? Well, and I think unfortunately not, but buying local may be the easiest solution that I have for you, at least to date. I think we can see that this is going to take us well into the second quarter, more than likely. Um, it is a deep flaw in the supply chain system that involves a number of stakeholders. I mentioned the, 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 the challenges with trucking schedules and driver schedules. Well, there's longshoremen, there's uh, port authority, there's just so many different entities, all not really working in unison as, as they need to, to unclog the situation. Uh, normally, you'd see a two days to unload a ship. Um, that can be anywhere from nine days out on the uh, East Coast, West Coast, or excuse me, the West Coast, um, shorter amount of days here in the state of Texas. But we're going to have to stay ahead of that, and we're working diligently with our stakeholders in Texas to ensure that we don't see the problems that we're seeing in California. It's still so amazing to see all of those shipping containers just sitting there and knowing that it's having a, nas a nationwide impact. John Esparza, President and CEO of the Texas Trucking Association, thanks for some time here this evening. Thanks for having me. Appreciate your time. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Some quick construction to tell you about uh, this evening. These main lane closures will continue on the west side. Military to Marbach, 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., so watch out for that. Also have uh, some construction and some delays here on the uh, west side. Uh, this is going to continue tonight as well. Closure Alamo Ranch Parkway at uh, Westwood Loop for bridge work. That begins at 9 this evening. This should be the only uh, closure this evening. I'm already seeing some slow traffic there as well. We've been telling you about uh, this crash here at Wiseman and Cottonwood Way five vehicle crash. Uh, we're seeing less of the red, so that might be a good sign there that this is uh, starting to clear up soon. Uh, meanwhile, on 151, we have a crash there at Westover Hills, 13 minutes still heading westbound from Loop 410 to Loop 1604. And finally, we also have a crash here on the north side. This is a 281 near Wurzbach Parkway. Can see the wide view there. Looks like at least one lane is shut down. So another busy evening on the road. Steve Amara. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside with live cam this evening. What happened to fall? We are wanting those <laughs> fall like temperatures to make a comeback, Sarah. It'll be back. Don't worry, Myra. We're going to see a cold front here in the next couple of days, but it's actually still pretty warm outside. Let's take a look at current temperatures. Still 74 in San Antonio, still in the 80s in some places like Del Rio and Catula. Tonight, we won't be too cool. Temperatures will fall mid 60s by midnight. But guess what? Tonight, we've got a space station flyover. Perfect conditions to see that. All the information on that, and we'll have a look at a cold front heading our way right after the breaks. So, you know, you grow a beard in November for No Shave November, fighting cancer, men take care of your health. You're thinking it's going to be maybe 70s, you know? Yeah, it'll be nice. Don't have to worry about 80s. Yeah. Beard weather. Then today happens. Not so much. Not beard weather. Well, what if I say that eventually it'll be beard weather, Steve? Does that cheer you up a little bit? Will it be in November eventually? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So he's yes. gonna have to, he's gonna have to grin and beard it. Oh, oh Myra that is good. In. I like that. Hey. Yeah. 
Yes. I got go, a ton of applause from yes. him. Moving up in the world, guys. Well, you're joining. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> and, he bring, and he brings me back down. You're joining right. in the pun fun. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, we've got a space station flyover tonight. Adam is at home making thermometers for the thermometer giveaway, but he made sure to give me the space station flyover information. So if you want to check it out, it is uh, going to be uh, peaking at about 703, 53 degrees above the horizon. It'll rise in the south southwest. So check that out if you can. For now, let's go ahead and take a look at what the day had for us. We had temperatures uh, climbing up to 80 degrees for the afternoon high temperature. That was uh, well above average by eight degrees and our morning low was above average too. We only got down to 54, so not no shave November weather out there today. And the big reason uh, for the increase in the fog and stuff this morning was the increase in humidity. You can actually see on the satellite imagery that we had a deck of low level clouds and fog west of I-35 that lasted until about lunch. But then we saw plenty of sunshine and we've been looking at clear skies since temperatures uh, have been well above average too because of the return of some humidity. Dew points are right on that muggy range there, right at about 60 degrees. And of course, we've had uh, steady winds from the south today. That's helped to increase that Gulf of Mexico moisture. And looking at the future cast here, we're going to have very similar weather tomorrow too. A deck of clouds west of 35 is possible in the early morning hours. Visibility could be reduced to a mile in spots. So if you have an early morning commute, know that you'll be dealing with some of that fog out there. Uh, but then once again, clear skies in the afternoon and it will get warm too. We'll be looking at a high temperature close to 82 degrees around San Antonio. So 10 degrees above the seasonable average high up in the hill country, though, where the clouds may hang on a little bit longer. Temperatures should only be up in the upper 70s for the high uh, 85 in Del Rio, 87 in Catula and 87 for the high temperature in Laredo. We are quiet across the central plains as a high pressure system is keeping us fairly dry and at the surface that high pressure system is, is moving our winds around from the southeast bringing in that Gulf of Mexico moisture. You can see where the cold core of air is up in the uh, eastern uh, corridor of the United States. Temperatures are well into the 30s uh, and even lower out there as they deal with their first snow of the season. But look out towards Seattle. 47 degrees. That's where our next cold front is right now. It's going to be a Pacific cold front. I mean, the air is going to come from the Pacific Ocean. So think about like California, how it feels really nice in California off in the Pacific. It's going to feel really nice for us by the time this front moves through on uh, early Thursday morning. But until then, don't bank on a ton of rain with this front. It's going to be moving through Wednesday night into Thursday morning, bringing with it only a small 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm. Behind that front, though, it'll be in the 60s. We'll struggle to get out of the 60s both Thursday and Friday. But tomorrow's going to be a warm one. Again, patchy fog in the morning, 60 degrees for the morning low, 82 in sunshine for the high temperature. It's going to be more breezy tomorrow, too. South winds 10 to 20, gusting up to 25 miles per hour. Then that front knocks our temperatures back down. Uh, in the 60s Thursday and Friday chilly morning to start Friday morning. So Steve that beard will come in handy by Friday morning. <laughs> so I just have to grin and beard it. You do. As Myra says until you know, Thursday. It was it was worth repeating, wasn't it? it I'm was. on Myra's side. This that was funny. I, I'm on her Thank side. You. I said it was funny. Wow. I gave her an applause. All right. He did. He did. He did. He did. Yeah. her props. Yeah. Pun I got, props. I got pun props. Yeah. In yeah. case you missed it coming up next. <laughs> Here's today's ICYMI. And just like that, we are midway through November. Good morning, everybody. It's Monday, November 15th. People are recovering after being pinned inside a car after a rollover overnight along Loop 410 just before Bandera Road. This happened around 1 this morning. Police say the driver lost control of his car and drove off the highway onto the access road and hit a big rock in front of the Toyota deal dealership. The car rolled into several parked cars and the man and woman inside were pinned. They had to be rescued by firefighters. Both were taken to the hospital. Investigators are trying to determine if alcohol was a factor in this crash. The long barrack was built roughly 300 years ago. The site was closed to visitors in 2019 to allow the Alamos Preservation Team to conduct an investigation to assess the building's condition. Police say a mother and her two children were visiting family, and while they were leaving, two SUVs pulled up between their vehicles 
vehicle and started shooting at each other. That's when the mother realized her three-year-old son was shot in the leg. Surrounded by members of Congress from both parties, President Biden signing into law the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. The law sets aside $110 billion to repair aging highways and bridges, $65 billion for high-speed internet, and $39 billion for public transportation. Democrat Beto O'Rourke is now running for that position. He made the announcement this morning on Twitter officially and through an interview with Texas Monthly. Said he was running for governor to to improve public schools, health care, and jobs in Texas. Welcome back. Still watching some delays on the uh, west side near 1604 and 151. Also watching that earlier crash on Wiseman. Still uh, watching delays too on the north side. This is uh, 281 at San Pedro. There is a, a crash uh, there. Actually, we're going back here to the uh, west side. Let's skip this next one as well to show you 281. And there's a slow crawl of traffic there southbound. So watch out for that this evening, Sarah. Thanks, Samuel. Mild tonight, and we'll see some fog to start the morning tomorrow. 60 degrees to start the day, 82 Tuesday. Ditto weather on Wednesday. Then that front arrives Wednesday night to Thursday morning. A small chance for rain, but a strong chance for much colder weather. We're looking at highs only in the 60s Thursday and Friday, and then a more mild weekend before our next front arrives on Sunday. Ditto weather. I like that. Ditto weather. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. And thank you for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the night beat at 10.